Hi. So today we are going to talk about um, web interfaces for devices. That means um, serving an HTML page from an embedded device and allowing the user to interact with the device via this kind of interface. Um, basically, we are going to talk about a web server that we are going to embed on the device, uh, a few words about HTTP, uh, about the gadgets that use this thing, uh, web services, web sockets, and at the end, if you have any questions, I'll answer them gladly. So first of all, the web server. So what is a web server? The web server is basically a piece of software that serves a web page. Mean, that means an HTML file. So when we are talking about a web server, we are not referring to the box, like the computer, but to a piece of software. Uh, the piece of software implements the HTTP or HTTPS protocols. Um, in ancient times, that means 25 years ago, it would run on some mainframes. Um, it migrated easily to computers, like mostly everybody that's doing some programming has a web server at home, and now it's migrating to gadgets. Uh, and when I say gadgets, I refer to these ones, like printers, routers, and even the Nest thermostat. So basically, we can find uh, web servers everywhere, and um, you will see that these are really, really e useful when it comes to building web interfaces, or interfaces for devices, sorry. Okay, so a few words about HTTP. Like HTTP is a protocol that was invented at CERN by Tim Berners-Lee. The idea was for scientists to be able to share documents. That's why we call HTML pages documents. Um, it is really easy to implement. The HTTP protocol, HTTP protocol is a text-based protocol. That means it's easy to be understood by humans. Um, and it usually transfers HTML pages together with the multimedia files that come with it, like pictures, videos, um, so on and so forth. Um, so why do we use a web server in the context of IoT? Basically, we use it to build user interfaces. Meaning, if we have a device, and please look at the router over here, the user needs to have a way to interact with it. It's either with buttons and a small screen, either with a big screen and touch, touches, sorry, touch buttons. The problem with this kind of interface is that it's expensive, like you need a screen, you need physical buttons, and the, the landscape for the screen is really, really small. So everything that the user does needs to be, uh, needs to fit in somewhere from 10 centimeters to 5 centimeters. And this is a challenge. So the best thing that we came up with, actually the industry came up with, is web pages. The idea is to embed inside the device a small web server, which doesn't necessarily implement the full, st the full protocol of HTTP, but is capable enough to serve some HTML pages, meaning that the interface for the device will become your browser or nowadays your phone. So when you buy a device, instead of pushing buttons on it uh, or having a screen, you will simply connect the device to the network, or the device will build an access point for you. You connect your computer slash phone to it and access a web page. In case of a web page, your screen real estate is really big because the screen is constrained only, like the user interface is constrained only to your screen, to the size of your screen. Most of the routers that you have at home will have a web, web page for configuration. Um, Soon you will find fridges that will do this, uh, washing machines, whatever gadget you will buy. Most probably you will have a way to configure it. Probably not a web page, but a phone. You will connect it to the phone. Interestingly enough, your phone will still use a web server on the device. If you have any questions, up to here. Okay, uh, in order to build these kind of user interfaces, we need to understand how HTTP works. Basically, what we need to do is to serve some HTML pages to the user and also collect some data from the user. 
So a few words about HTTP. When it comes to HTTP, you, you we always have a client, which is your browser, and we have a server, which in our case will be the, the gadget. The information always starts with a query that the client creates. So the client will make a request to the server, the server will process the request and hand it over to the client. And for every, every time the client needs something from the server, this repeats. So the client generates a request, sends it to the server, server processes it, and sends back a response. It's never the other way around. So a few words about the HTTP protocol. Basically, the request is formed out of the headers. These are some parameters that the client sends to the server. A method, a URL, and that's the resource that the client wants to access. And optionally, a query string or an upload body. In case of the response, so that's the information that the server sends to the client, it will have a status that will say, okay, this was fine, no, this was an error. It will have some headers, like some parameters that the server sends to the client, and optionally, some data. So if the client requested some data from the server, this is the data that it comes back, that comes back. For the query, so this is how uh, an address for HTTP looks like. It has the protocol, it has an address, it has optionally a port, a URL, and optionally a question mark and the query string. So let's see, if we have this address over here, or this, this request basically, what's the actual address in this one? So it's wildloading.cs.pub.row. What's the port? It seems that it doesn't have a port. Actually, it does. HTTP, by default, functions on port 80. HTTPS, which is the, HTTP, the secure version of HTTP, functions on 443. Now, if a browser doesn't see a port after the address, it will assume, based on the protocol that you use, that it will be the default port. So in our case, it's going to be 80. So port is 80. What's the URL? Project. Projects? Not only. It's slash projects. So the URL starts right after the port or the address. And what's the query string? It's without the question mark, show equals true. So it's like this. While in CS pub row, port 80, URL slash projects, and the query string is show equals true. The query string is a string formed out of variable equals value, ampersand, variable equals value, another ampersand, and so on and so forth. Value equals, uh, variable equals value. You can have as many variables as you want. You can have a custom query string where you just put a string, but then it's your business on the server to actually interpret that. If you really want to follow the HTTP, then it's um, variable equals value. Okay, about the methods. So every query that the client does has a method. You can have a get, post, put, delete, and there's others, like options, headers. The most important are these four, out of which the most used are the first two. Get. Get will mean that we want a resource from the server and the server should give us a resource. This is what happens when you write an address in your browser. Like the browser will generate a query with a get method and get a page, a picture, a CSS file, a music file, something. For the post, post means that we actually modify a resource on the server. So we have a form, we complete the form, hit the button, and we make usually a post. In the traditional description, post will modify a resource. The contrast between get and post is that get will have no payload in the query. So there's really no payload in the query. After the headers, the query stops. 
for the post, you have the headers and then you have some payload. Uh, think of a post like an upload, like when you upload some data to the server. Put is the same thing as post, but um, semantically, it describes the fact that we want to make a new resource on the server. Technically speaking, these are the same. Post and put are the same. But semantically, the server should understand we want a new resource. Delete, it's pretty clear, we want to delete the resource. Delete has no payload, and the server should delete the resource. This is in theory, in practice, usually the first two are used. Because get is the same technically as delete, that there's no technical difference, just a semantic thing. Uh, and post and put are technically the same. So if you really want to make them the right way by the book, use all the four of them. If you just want to upload things or get uh, resources, the first two should be enough. 90% of the cases, that's what happens. So let's get back to our picture. So the query, will gener the browser will generate a, a, requ a request. We'll send it to the server. As you can see, what's the method that the uh, client used here? It's get at some kind of URL. What would be the URL here? Slash path slash file. HTTP version, which is 1.1. That's what the client requests. And this is a property, a header. Host, column, and uh, a value. There's several standard properties or headers that the client could send. Server will process, send back a response. It will respond with the web version of HTTP that it knows. Here, in this case, it knows the same version as the client, so it's fine, it's 1.1. The server will never respond with a higher version of HTTP, but might respond with a lower version. So if the server is dummier, then it will respond, okay, I, I can't do HTTP 1.0, I will, 1.1, uh, I will do 1.0. Um, 200 is the status, 200 means okay. So everything from two, uh, at 200, 200 something will be okay. 300 something would be, it was the page was moved, 400 would be an error, and 500 would be a catastrophic server error. So that would be some server failure. Next to the status code, you have the explanation of the status code, which in our case was okay. We found the resource, here it is, and this would be the payload over here. And the browser will actually get the payload, show you the page, and that's it. If it needs to get something else, it will make a new query. So when you load an HTML page, it will load the page. It will look at your links, like pictures, scripts, uh, CSS files, music videos, and start downloading one by one. As you can see, sometimes the page loads, and then you start seeing the pictures, right? This is what happens. The, que the, s the client will make another query, so on and so forth. Just as a fact, the browser will make two, two simultaneous queries for the same server, not more than them. So if you have 100 pictures, two of them will be transferred in parallel, and then the rest of them will be enqueued until another connection is empty. Any questions? Okay, a few words about the gadgets. So, servers are clear. Like, we have them for 25, more than 25 years. That's fine. Usually, start the mainframes, computers, and now we get them to gadgets. So in our case, we will have to run a small server on the gadgets. Like if we make, make an in, if you take an industrial server like Apache and run it on a gadget, it's nice, but we are going to waste resources. Most probably our gadget won't be accessed directly from the internet, and I, I strongly uh, advise you not to do this. It will be accessed from inside our local network, so the server doesn't need to be really resistant to denial of service attacks or some kind of attacks that will kill it. Uh, that's the responsibility of our firewall in the local network. Um, for our case, we will use the streams language, and we have some nodes which are called web and web responses. So this is how your schematics should look like. Uh, for every page that you want to serve to the user, you will have a node like this, with an address over here, with an URL. Whenever the, a browser or some device will access your web server, this node will generate a message and send it over the cable to some processing. You have nodes which send responses to the client. The only limitation is if you have a message from a web node, it's need, it needs to have one single path to a response. 
like you cannot make another path here to another response that will show an error so once you get a response you can send only one uh, sorry once you get the request you can send only one response um, if you don't send a response your browser will still keep running and sometime it will tell you okay uh, time out this guy is not responding so even if you don't have to send data back to the client just respond with an empty message so that the browser can close the connection okay so basically you have a node which is called web this is not a web server actually it's a URL so for each URL that you want to access on your device you need a node called web this one will generate a web server for you okay so this one will generate a web server for you this means the first URL node that you place will generate the server the others will just use it okay so um, for each node like this you have to set a route uh, you have to set the method that you want the URL to respond to and the port of the server whenever you have a request this is how the message will look like it will have a payload and the payload will be either the decoded query string like an object with every variable and its value or if it's a post or a put you will have the payload which was encoded some way decoded to an object request and response and next are objects that are generated by the JavaScript engine or Node.js engine via the Re Express framework. So if you know Express framework, those are the objects from the Express framework. Going on. Responses. There's three nodes with responses. The most easiest one is web response. It will send, you can configure the status and you can configure it to redirect the browser to another page. So if you put something in the redirect string, when somebody accesses your URL, it will redi redirect the browser to this URL over here. If there's nothing here, the response will be the, the payload that was entered into the node. So whatever is in the payload object will be sent to the browser. Um, the web HTML node is a node that allows you to write HTML code. So whenever it receives a message, it will send to the browser the HTML that you wrote in the configuration um, dialog. There's also a checkbox here called replace variables. When it sends the HTML, it can do two things. If this one is unchecked, right, replace variables is unchecked, it will just send the HTML. It does not matter whatever it gets in the message, when this node gets a message it just sends the HTML if you check replace variables it does the following inside the HTML you can have the double braces like you can put values in double braces those will be replaced either with uh, attributes from the payload so if the payload is an object and it has different properties so each property in the payload may be replaced in double braces or with a global variable if you remember you had a node with value so whatever global variable you have you can write its name in this HTML in double braces and this node will replace it before sending it to the browser is this clear so whenever you do this no problem the web template node does the same thing as the web HTML node with one exception it loads a file so in your um, project structure you can have a folder we call static you just give it a file it will load the file uh, sorry a full templates it will load the file and send it to the browser it will always replace double braces okay so whenever you use web HTML or template this is usually how it goes you have a, an, a URL you get a request and you put it into a web HTML basically you will send the page to the user 
Now, if you want to put some meaningful data into the page, this is the simplest that you can do. It's a simple HTML page with a double brace and the name sensor inside. Besides the web stream here, we have a run, an analog read, and we save the analog read value into a value node called sensor. This, this value node will create a global variable which will be replaced in this HTML each time a browser asks for this page. Any questions here? So the general idea is do whatever you do, collect data on your device, store it in global variables. Whenever you get a request, no problem, just put the variable in double braces and check the replace variables. The problem, be careful. The value will be refreshed only when the user's user refreshes the page. Is this clear? So you will send the value to the user, but if the user does not refresh your interface, that value will never change because the replacement is done before it is sent to the browser. Is it clear? So it's a simple method to do this, but the drawback is that it's not going to be live. For some applications, this is enough. And this is the cheapest way to do it, meaning cheapest, the most, the, the less power consuming way. So how do we run the server? We just start our project, but we need the IP of the device. There's two ways you can do this. Once in Wireload in Studio, you have the name of the device and you have an IP address. Or if you connect via a serial cable to the device, you can just open a shell and write if config. And you can see the IP address over here for the ATH0 usually. Depends on your network card. Don't forget the port. So it's the IP address, column, the port. Protocol is always HTTP. So for the moment, we do not support HTTPS. And we are going to talk at security, why not? Any questions here? What we've discussed so far was sending pages. This is super nice if the user has a browser. What if the user has a mobile app? It's going to be difficult for the user to make, not for the user, for the programmer of that app, to make an app, connect to your device, get an HTML page that is full of um, design elements, strip them out and get just the data that it wants. Because for a mobile app, the mobile app already has a user interface. It just needs the data. And this is where web services come into place. A web service is more or less the same thing as a web page. The only difference being the response from the server does not contain design elements. So instead of having an HTML page, you will have either an XML page either a JSON string, either some text values, CSV values. So the idea is to use the server just as a data provider and have a user interface made somehow else. It's either a mobile app, either it's an HTML page, but download it from another, sp another place. This is, how, this is the general idea. Like you have the server, um, you have the database, and every client will be able to connect to it and extract data. How does the client get the user interface is not the problem of this server. Is it clear? That's a web service. A huge advantage. This way you can have multiple user interfaces on different devices which are completely different but use the same data altogether. In, ed in order to make a web service the only difference is that we do not use HTML, we use the web response. Like if we have a message with a payload and we put it into a web response, we actually make a web service. We never send HTML, we just send an object. And here is an example. Let's say uh, we have a global variable sensor. Remember the one that we have before. We, ha we make a URL slash sensor. We set the payload of the message to the sensor value 
and send a web response. Like you have the URL, you have a set over here. In the set, you can see you have a double brace. The set node accepts double braces and replaces the value with the global variable and says, sends a web response. This is how the web response will look like. Is it clear? Okay. How do we use this in an HTML page? Like, if you put this in a browser, what's going to happen? What's the outcome? So if in the browser we put slash sensor, what will we see? We're going to see a number. So that's it. it. It only sends a number. So we will see an empty page with one number, the value of the sensor. This is not a UI. So if you want to build a UI, this is what you need to do. You make an HTML page that is full of design. Wherever you need the value of the sensor, we will use jQuery. jQuery is a JavaScript library that allows us to do uh, a lot of things, among others, make HTTP requests without refreshing the page. Think of them like background HTTP requests. And this is done with a simple function. It's a dollar, that's the jQuery, dot get. We put the URL over here. As you can see, I have no address, no port. If I have only a URL, the browser will suppose it's the same address and port as this web page. If you need something different, just put the full address. And whenever this get actually succeeds, like it contacts, contacts our gadget, gets the reply, it will call this function, giving us the data that it got back. Is this clear? So we make a request. Our program finishes here. Whenever the request is ready, it will send us back the data. Once we have the data, we can either display it to the screen, as I can doing here, or use jQuery and put it somewhere in the HTML page. This is another story already. Is this clear? So this is how you can do um, a web service. So the question is here, how can we make a page, an HTML page, uh, with a dynamic value, meaning we have this HTML page, how do we make a sensor value in the, this HTML page to update every second? So what we need to do, basically, is to call this get every second. Like, instead of loading the whole HTML page, we load it once, and then we use the service that is on, is on our gadget to get the value of the sensor. And we can do this every second. This is different from loading the page every second. If we refresh the page every second, it will flicker. Secondly, it will use network bandwidth, because we need to transfer the whole HTML file, and all the graphic assets in it, and other multimedia objects, and also the gadget will need to process the HTML page to replace variables. So basically the improvement is we send a static HTML, which the gadget doesn't need to process. We send it once. We send the pictures and the multimedia files one time. And then using JavaScript and the service URLs in our gadget, we get the sensor values and refresh them every second. Is this clear? The problem here still is that we need to refresh the sensor every second. If we have a sensor that doesn't change for an hour, we don't know that. So every second we need to refresh this. This is not very um, efficient, but this is limited due to the fact that only the client can initiate communication with the server. So there's no way for the server to tell us, okay, listen, I have new values, just use them. So the extension for that is the WebSocket. This is an extension to the HTTP protocol. Most of the gateways and routers know about it, and servers, some don't. The WebSocket uses HTTP or HTTPS to transfer data, but does something different. Meaning, it generates an HTTP request from the client, but instead of asking for a normal connection, it will put a special header and it will ask the server to upgrade the connection. If the server knows about it, excellent. It will say, connection is upgraded, and this, this connection does not end after the server response. 
from that moment on, the server and the client will have a TCP connection where both can send data back and forth. So the client can send data to the server and the server can send data to the client. Obviously, the client needs an additional piece of software for this and the server needs an additional piece of software for this. Um, in case the server doesn't recognize the upgrade a header, it will just say, sorry, I don't know, what, what's this? The client will understand, okay, no WebSocket here, and there's two ways that this can go on. Either the client drops it and says, okay, sorry, user, we can't use the WebSocket, or usually the client will fake a WebSocket, meaning it will make a request, get a response, make a request, get a response, and it will do this, and you, as a user, will have the impression that you will actually have a socket, but it does a lot of queries. Of course, with long timeouts, and this is a different story. But most of the libraries for WebSockets will try to build an actual WebSocket. If this is not possible due to some, some problem, they will just fake it. It will consume more bandwidth, but from the programmer point of view, this is the same. One of these libraries is called Socket.io. Socket.io has two libraries actually, one for the browser and one for the server. In our case, you cannot control the WebSocket, but every server that you create will have a WebSocket capability built into it. And if you look at the value nodes, you know the global value nodes that we discussed a few days ago, they have a checkbox with publish to the WebSocket. So what this does, each time a value is stored in that node, if you have at least one web server, it will send that value to the WebSocket. So if the web server has clients that are connected on the socket, they will get an update. On the HTML part, you need to include Socket.io. Because each web server has the socket capability, your own web server is able to serve your the library. So the web server that the gadget has will be able to serve you the library. So this line stays exactly the same. What you need to do is to connect, and if you have no parameters, the connection, it will assume it's the server where it downloaded the library from, and then you have like this socket on value. Each time a value is changed, you will have a call to this function. So you just register a function for the tag value. Each time a value is changed, like you store a value, this one will be called. So you don't have to make a get, you don't have to do anything. Just register a function when a, value, a new value comes and you will get the information over here. The information actually is an object with a parameter called variable and the name that you have here and value and the value that was pushed to this node. Any questions here? So this is all that you need to do to get values in your user interface. And this is super fast. Like you don't make queries, you just have a TCP connection. Whenever you have a value, it will ship it to you. Okay, so for the user interface, uh, it's really nice to make use of jQuery and the classic way of building user interfaces but it's really, really, um, it can get really, really messy. So there are a lot of frameworks that will help you build web interfaces. Think of a web interface not as an HTML page, but a very complicated user interface software. It's the same way you build programs or user interfaces in Java, in um, Python, or in another language, it's the same thing in HTML code can get really, really long. So you have frameworks for building HTML applications. Most common is Angular, second one is React, third one is Vue. Angular is pretty big, mostly, especially Angular 2. It's gonna be difficult for the browser to actually process it, especially that you might use the user interface on some devices like the phones, which are not very capable. Secondly, you have React, which is pretty complicated and has a steeper learning curve. And we have Vue, which is really fast in rendering, and it's more lightweight. Vue has the following idea. Inside the HTML page, you choose an element. 
and here we choose a div and give it an ID whatever ID you want just ignore the value inside at the end of the HTML page you make a script and you make a new view object the view object has an L property which means element and this is a jQuery selector so this is where you specify to view which element inside the HTML do you want view to manage so view will ignore the we will ignore everything in HTML except this div and whatever is inside this div. And this is due to the fact that you place the element here. In our case, it's called view, but it doesn't matter. You, you can call it whatever you want. Second object is a data object. This is where you can put data elements, data elements that view will replace inside the div. It's very, very important to declare all the data elements here. If an element is not here, view will not be able to handle it. Then you have some methods. You can define some methods, which you can call. And you have some uh, um, event functions like created, mounted, unmounted. Created means this will be executed when this element is created. Mounted will be executed when this element uh, will be placed on the page. Unmounted when it's erased from the page. We will use just created. Once again, this is how you build a view object. Now, inside this div, between double braces, it will replace the value from the data. So what will be the value here in the value? Zero. Zero. Funny fact is, whenever you change the value in this data, view will automatically re-render the HTML. So from whatever function you change this value, view will automatically change it in the HTML. You don't have to get this element, put the content inside, no way. Once you have view loaded, whenever you change the data, view will handle the rendering automatically. Here's an example of updating a sensor in real time. So what are we doing? We're loading view. We are loading the socket. We have this div, the exact same example before, we have the data and in created we will say like this connect the socket and whenever you get the value if the values name is the sensor just set the sensor value whenever you do this view will automatically update the HTML and this works for anything like you can do this inside properties of HTML you can hide you can show properties like it's really really cool Nothing. You don't have to do anything to tell the HTML, okay, change the value here. No, just change the data. View is what we call a data-driven application. So all you need to do is change the data, and view will handle the rendering for you. Um, it m you might have an, a question here. We have that equals this. This is okay in any function inside view, but the function that the WebSocket will call will not be the view function. So you need to save the pointer to this. This is why we made that equals this, and we used that over here. This inside the function would refer to the function here instead of this one. Uh, that is not a keyword. You can use whatever variable you want. You can call it super or my special variable, or we just um, store this here equals this. So this is a common mistake that people do to use this over here. Any questions? Seems okay? Super. So this would be it. Um, this would be an introduction to how we build user interfaces. Um, just remember HTML is the easiest way. Um, the best practice is to have one URL with an HTML that is static, but that loads a WebSocket and uses some kind of framework to build a user interface. And that's the only HTML that you transfer. All the other URLs that you build are just services for getting data. Sensor value, uh, buttons value, whatever. Any questions?